uh, doing our show in uh, Veronica's office. It's too cold outside. We've been doing them in the barn, I mean in the uh, warehouse. Thank you very much for tuning in. We're going to, uh, you may have noticed I'm sitting by myself. Gina and Kim uh, are attending the uh, Pigeons on the Prairie show in Des Moines, Iowa. They left uh, Wednesday. It's a 12 hour drive. They got there safely, got everything set up, and they're, they're selling. If you are in the Des Moines area, uh, it's a great show to go to. All kinds of breeds, there are a lot of specialty clubs. I don't know the actual number, but uh, the girls will be there today and till uh, later in the afternoon tomorrow, and uh, then they'll be heading home. Um, lots to talk about, but I was trying to decide what we could talk about as a main theme. And what we're going to do, and I'll probably be repeating this again because the show doesn't officially start until three, but by starting a little early, it gives Veronica some time to get everything uh, updated. If, the, uh, if everything works out well, Gina is going to join us from Iowa, probably tell us a little bit about what's going on there. But if, uh, if technically, if it doesn't work out, um, I'm well prepared uh, to do the show by myself, although I certainly don't like to. Uh, I've done it before, and I'd much rather have my daughter, Gina, sitting next to me. I can pick on her and get a lot of, get a lot of giggles. I um, wanted to announce the uh, winners of the auctions that Foy has every week, um, and uh, the auctions actually ended at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, I'll be bringing in some birds next Monday, uh, and uh, no, we aren't going to have an auction the following week, are we, Veronica? No, you'll be back. You'll be back. Yeah. All right. So I'll bring in some birds uh, for our next auction. The uh, winner of the uh, the birds, oh, I've got it right here. I find it. What do I do with it? There it is. Oh. We had uh, a pair of Gabriels, a uh, very rare breed, a pretty pair of pigeons. And I was uh, very, very pleased to see uh, Mohammed Alfandari, Alfandari, well, anyways, Mohammed Alfandari. I hope I'm right. Uh, he is the winner. Uh, he bought that pair of Gabriels. Like I said, a very rare uh, pair of birds. And if you went online looking for them, you're going to find lots of people trying to find them. Not many people have them. Well, Muhammad has a pair. He bid $400. We sure do appreciate it. One of the higher, higher bids we've got since we've been on the show. But it uh, tells a, a bit about the uh, rarity of the birds. We also had a pair of pedigree racing homers. I forgot to bring the, bid, the uh, pedigree forms in with me, but they were sold. Um, and in fact, I talked to the gentleman. His name's Chad Nix. Uh, it was a bit of a bidding war. The bidding started at two thirty and went up and went up. And I say two two thirty two hundred and thirty dollars. Uh, and Chad Nix called in, not called in. He emailed, right, Veronica? Facebook message. You know, a Facebook message. Uh, anyways, he he sent the message. His top bid was three hundred and fifty dollars. Now both of those. Uh, thank you, Chad. Both of those pair will be going out. Uh, on Tuesday, good Lord willing, and it doesn't snow too much and that kind of thing, I, I try to ship out every Tuesday. So, uh, Chad has called in with his credit card information, um, and we'll be talking to Gina on Monday. Uh, Muhammad, we very much appreciate it. If you call uh, either today, I can get your credit card information, or Monday at the latest. Uh, so, we hope to hear from Muhammad today and Chad we've already heard from and he'll be uh, placing, uh, giving the credit card information to Gina when she comes back. So, uh, let's see. Uh, we have a question already. I've got lots of stuff to talk about, but this is great because I tell everybody what makes the show work, and you've heard this by so many other people who do shows, is you uh, contributing to the show. So, um, by sending in a Facebook message, we can answer your question. Michael asked, why don't you put pedigrees on the auction? Well, um, it's a good question. In fact, uh, Max, if you were watching, uh, Chad Nix just, yeah, just bought a pair of pedigree homers. They were from McLaughlin Loft. And I think the other ones, 
I'm sorry, but they were pedigree. If you watch our show on a regular basis every every other Friday, uh, you'll see more of these birds. Uh, this uh, I've got some great pigeons in. I had pretty sure 12 pair uh, donated by us from some of the uh, greatest pigeons in the United States and from the Gannis Loft, from Beef Loft, from Continental Breeding, uh, and they all have pedigrees. The pair that we just sold today, it went for $400 a pair uh, for the pair, and uh, the pedigree are sent out separately with the birds. So uh, if you're looking for pedigree birds, we're going to have them over the next uh, six or seven shows. That's on the racing pigeons. On the fancy birds, we don't always get pedigrees with them. They're just not as important to uh, fancy pigeons as they are to racing pigeon fancy. So thanks for uh, sending the question and kind of leads me into telling people we will have uh, the uh, fancy birds, I'm sorry, the auctions of uh, pedigree pigeons over the next you know, couple of months, almost every show. Gina can be brought in anytime you want. I want to bring her in now while I'm uh, taking the next question. Claire Hare, her, H-E-R-R, when you open up a bag of pigeon pellets, how long does the feed usually last until it goes bad? Well, of course, the, the question is, is how often do you use it? How many birds do you have? Um, but I've, brought, I've uh, fed pellets uh, in the past. I feed my chickens pellets. What, I don't have chickens anymore. The coyotes kill them all. But uh, up until two or three weeks ago, the pellets would be open for well over a month. The important thing with pellets is to keep them dry as you possibly can. Um, and if the bags that they come in are in pa paper bags, uh, try putting them in a, some sort of a sealed plastic trash can or plastic container uh, and you keep it closed. That'll keep the dampness out. But pellets do, uh, I would feel perfectly safe uh, that you give some thought to uh, one month lasting before you do anything. Okay, well, that's a good question. I do appreciate it. Is this the same gentleman? Um, no, okay. Um, Mr. Herr, uh, uh, let's see, is a 24 by 16 foot rectangular cage. Oh, that, I'm guessing that's inches. Doesn't say, but it must be 24 by 16 inches. There's enough space for a pair of Birmingham. Uh, yes, it is. Absolutely no question at all. Uh, the, the rule of thumb that roughly uh, three square foot to four square foot uh, for a pair of uh, racing holders. The Birmingham rollers are much smaller, half the size. So I would think, yeah, you could keep those, uh, keep the birds in there permanently. You didn't mention how deep it is from front to back, uh, but if it's anywhere from 12 to 16, you, you've got plenty of space for a pair, uh, pair of rollers. Thanks, Mr. Hill. Okay. While we're waiting for Gina to come on board, and for some of you who are just joining the show, because we usually do start at three o'clock, and I'll give that a couple of more minutes until we get Gina on. She's coming right now. Okay, but Gina is doing a show with Kim in Iowa. They left Wednesday, and uh, uh, they got there Wednesday night, set up all day today. Uh, no, they set up Thursday and are selling products there. If you uh, have never been to the, Mo to the, the Des Moines show, um, in Iowa, you might want to take it in if you're in an area. It's a great show, and one of the bigger shows in that part of the country. Uh, if you really want to know how to get there, you can always call me, call me and we'll get that information for you. Gina is uh, uh, joining us from Iowa. Um, she's, if, uh, she's going to be in and out, so to speak, we think. There's no signal. Does that mean anything? Okay, so she is watching the show? Okay, because I can't see her. Hi, Gina. I'm assuming Hi. I'm assuming they're there. Can, will we be able to hear her? You might. Okay. Well, it's all confusing to me. But anyway, how are things uh, at the show, Gina? It's going good. A little chilly here, but it's going good. Kind of slow today. Would you say that once more? Yeah, I said it's going good. A little bit chilly here and kind of slow today. They no. Put well, the until noon. Like I told your sister, when you leave there, don't have to come home straight through, uh, drive five or six hours, take a break, and then, then get, in, get a hotel room and start up in the morning. But you already know I said that, right? Yes. Okay. Do you have anybody that has questions there? If they do, 
while we're doing the show, you can um, just ask the question and we'll get an answer for you. I the definitely birds were sold, will. by the way, in the auction. We had a great auction. The Gabriels went for $400 and the racing pigeons went for 350 So that was great. Awesome. Uh, trying to get, uh, I had a guy here donate. A little bit so I can hear you. Um, anything you want to mention? I had a guy here donate two pair of birds already. We're having a problem with the sound. Not working real well, It's that. All right, we're, we're going to do our best. Anyway, um, I do. I had a couple of questions that I put aside. Would you hand me those, please? Um, gentleman did want to know about feeding pellets to his pigeons. And uh, I told him to oh, get pigeon pellets their best, but if you have a problem getting pigeon pellets, which you want to get it, try to get with turkey pellets. Now, turkey pellets uh, sometimes came with medication. I think the government stopped that. So they suggested you are going to use turkey pellets. They're much less expensive. Um, but to make sure they're not medicated. We're going to be talking about breeding, and I have that mentioned. So when you talk about pellets during breeding season, they're probably the best thing you can do. Uh, a lot of people don't like them. The only disadvantage of a pigeon pellet or any, any type of a pellet is that the dropping become loose and mushy. Uh, and some people think that's an issue. It really isn't. The cause is by the pellets themselves. So if you uh, feed pellets, you expect the dropping on the floor to be much faster and much more normal. The advantage also of the pigeon pellet, and I'll be talking about that as we go along, is when you're breeding I pigeon, uh, you want to try to increase the protein level. The average pigeon feed is between 11 and 12 percent protein. We do sell, and other people do sell, a higher protein pellet. The, the ideal pellet per protein percentage is between 15 and 18 percent. Uh, there are some grains that come with uh, 15 percent, but if you want to continue to feed what you're feeding, which is another issue. Uh, on, all you have to do is add about 10% pigeon pellet or, or 18% or 10% of a, a high protein grain feed. You can usually find a high protein grain at somewhere around 15 to 16%. So during breeding season, it's a good idea to change your feed to a high protein feed or continue to feed what you want and add 10% uh, of a high protein. Um, Gina, do you have anything you want to join, uh, mention on that? She's gone. She's gone? We lost her. Okay. Um, with, um, uh, if you don't want to feed a pellet or if you don't want to add a, a high percentage supplement to your feed, there are other things you can certainly do. Um, and in talking about that, there's a product, in fact, I've got a, well, I put it here. It's called Multibreed, and it's a high percentage supplement to the feed. It's made specifically for pigeons during the breeding season. So if you want to try something like this, it's a great product. I'll give you an idea what it has vitamins, minerals, trace elements, amino acids, MSM. So it's got a high level of lysine, too. And that's all meant to be used during the breeding season. And it also was recommended during the uh, molting season. So if you're looking for a good product, um, that's one you might want to think about. Do I, should I take a question, Ms. Lee? Okay, Greg Call. How much are the pigeon show boxes? Well, Greg, um, I'd appreciate it if you would call FOIS, 724-843. 6889, or you can mail us at voicepetsupplies.com. The reason I tell you that is we sell probably six or eight um, different uh, boxes. Uh, and if you buy one, it's one price, one, three, six, 12. The prices go down the more you buy. So if you call the store and ask 
to ask for Sherry if she should be available. We're very short-handed right now because uh, both Kim and Gina are in Oklahoma. So if you call the store, ask for Sherry, and she can give you the prices on all the various nest boxes we have. Um, the top of the line, I thought we had one here. The top of the line is an all plastic uh, basket. It's just, it's just a great, great basket. I use it in a lot of my lots, uh, not all of them, but um, then we have the wooden ones. And we, we just have a um, variety and we have them in all different sizes. So I uh, appreciate your, your asking, but it'd be a lot better if you were to uh, call the store, 724-843-6889. She'll get the catalog and quote the prices right off to you. Okay, boy, I'm, I'm really pleased to have all of these questions. We've got a question from Ed and we've got a question from Charlie. Before we go to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the nesting bowls. We've talked about them before, but for breeding season, I wanted to show you what I, what I do. Um, when I came in this afternoon, well, I came in this morning about 10 o'clock, I took some tobacco stems out of a box and put them in a bucket, bucket of water so I could give you an example of what I'm talking about. I've mentioned it before, but I, I use clay bowls in about every one of my uh, breeding cages. I use clay bowls. I like them because they're heavy and don't move. What I did was I took some um, tobacco stems, let them soak in water for two or three hours. And the reason I do that is if when you get a box of stems, they're dry, they're lightweight, uh, and uh, they're almost impossible to put in your nest bowl. So what I tell people is what I did here. I grabbed a bunch of uh, stems out of the box. I wrung them until as much of the water uh, that was on them I could get out by wringing them. And then I formed them into a nesting area. So you can see it's the perfect nest bowl. It's thick enough so that the birds themselves won't hit the bottom. Uh, and uh, also it it's, it hasn't formed, I mean, it hasn't dried out. It will dry this way, and you've got the perfect nest bowl. And this will last you the whole um, period of time that you've got the young ones in the nest bowl. When, the, when they're weaned, take the nest bowl out, clean it, sanitize it, just, just with bleach or something like that. Soak your nest, your uh, tobacco stems, form them. Uh, this isn't completely dry, but when they're completely dry, you've got the perfect uh, nest bowl. A uh, lot. What I also do is I might throw a few nests, uh, a few tobacco stems on the floor, even if they are wet. Uh, the birds seem to like to the, the, uh, to build their own nest, so this is fine. But if they want to take the time to make it more perfect for them, they know better what they want than I do. So this is just an idea uh, for breeding season. Been breeding season. Well, let me take Ed's question and we'll go back through that. Uh, Ed called, how many hours of light should you put on breeding pairs? Well, what I'd like to do, Ed, is the lights go on at dark. A little bit before dark, of course. I should have said dusk. Um, and you put the lights on, on a timer. I'm sure that's what you're going to do. And then you want the... Um, I'm sorry, I gave it to you just the opposite. I haven't had that question for a while. You want the lights to go on at midnight. And the reason for that, uh, and they're going to go off at daylight, and it changes a little bit. You can adjust the light, or you can make it like 8.30 in the morning, the lights uh, go off. The reason for that, if you did it the opposite way, and you wanted to, to have your lights go on uh, before dark, um, there are going to be times if those lights go off at midnight, it isn't going to work. I'm sorry. Yes. You want to join me? Well, I don't know if you wanted me to. Anyway. Yeah, you can join me. We've got a we've got a guest that's going to join us if I can get out of here. If you can get out. Uh, I don't know whether you can get in there. Because uh, I can barely get in there. Um, okay. This is live television, folks. I'm trying to get in here. There we go. There we go. So, what we're, can, uh, are, are we both on the screen okay? Okay. What we were talking about um, is the lighting for uh, Dan, uh, Dan, wasn't that his name? Doesn't, Ed, Ed was his name. I think. Anyway, I'll finish that up. You don't want the lights to go on at midnight. Uh, let me go on. Don't mind me. Get my brain settled. 
you don't want the lights to go off at midnight because what if at that particular time the uh, handler of the cock w went down to get a quick drink of water and the lights go out? You got a problem, they're not going to be able to find an S box. So when it comes to lighting, you want the lights to go off at midnight and you want, want the lights to come on at approximately 8, 8.30 when it's daylight. Uh, for those of don't know who this young lady is, is this is Sherry. Sherry's been with us coming on 14 years? Yes. Yeah, 14 yeah. years. Um, and I'm sure if you've called here one or two times, you've talked to Sherry. Sherry uh, does most of our packing, takes uh, a lot of our orders, sweeps the floor, uh, <laughs> empties the trash, feeds my pigeons, <laughs> whatever needs. Say hi, I'm getting a drink of water. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here with you. Um, I'm filling in for Gina, your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I think all of you folks watching know that uh, all of our people are really knowledgeable. And uh, when you call, um, there aren't too many questions they can't answer, which brings to mind, I wanted to talk about this. Um, I don't even know if it's for sale, but if it is for sale, Oh, it will be for sale. We just don't know what it costs right now. I hope so. It's for okay. sale. We have this book, uh, Jerry's Health Tips. Can you see it okay? Okay. The reason I wanted to mention it is it's chock full of information. I wrote it for the girls uh, when when we get called. You can see it. There's quite a few pictures in it as you go by. Uh, more writing than pictures, but there's other pictures in here. But the main thing is I wrote it so that over the years I've added to it and uh, Sherry and uh, Vicky and Kim and who's the other girl? You're, you're the favorite. Well, see, out, of, out of sight, you know, out of mind. Oh, no. see how you are. <laughs> but anyway, if you want a great book to have, uh, I wrote it. It's loose sleep. I don't want you to think it's, it's a major publication, but... Uh, give an idea. I don't even think we have an index here. We keep changing it. Building a loft. Uh, oh, that's her personal stuff there. Pardon? That's her personal you know, additive. So there's so many things in here that will help the beginning or beginner or somebody who's been around for a long time. So if you're interested in the book, it's called Jerry's Health Tips, uh, only for pigeons. So if you need it, give us a call. We got to send it out to you, and we'll figure out what it costs. What was that other book you gave me that a, said was a very good book yeah. to have also? Yeah, uh, uh, there's a uh, pig. It's on droppings, uh, pigeon droppings explained, or right. something yes. like that. A little tiny book, but if you've called us over the years, um, and, and if you've talked to Sherry and the other folks here too, when you have a health question. They're going to ask you questions. We've talked about this before. Uh, it isn't one, well, I just got a call. Yes, my birds, uh, my birds are sick. They're breathing through their mouths. Uh, what medication should I use? Would you be able to answer that question? Well, I could think it would be respiratory. No, they're breathing through. Okay, well, that's fine. It could be. But my point is, one question Always leads to, to another, another question, and we're going to ask you um, the droppings. What the yeah, droppings? What color are. the droppings are? Any are they all fluffed up? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Any others? Like any other symptoms? Are they drinking a lot? Uh -huh. um, How long has it been going on? Mm -hmm. uh, are they lingering or are they dying very very quickly? Young birds, whole bunch of stuff. old birds, limping, mm -hmm. twisted neck. So there's so many questions that we need to ask you. So you have to, so you supply us as much information as possible. And with the, uh, Jerry's health tip book, with the problem dropping, we also have one, uh, coughs and colds. Well, it's little pamphlets, but they're great to have. Um, but the girls know the books, and when they don't know, as a last resort, they call Super Jerry. That's right. <laughs> and and I, Papa. Yeah, I just I had a call, and I get calls all day long, but I just got a call, uh, not too, in fact, you took the call and left me a message, and I called him, uh, and I actually didn't know the answer for sure, so I told him I'd call him back, which I already have, and it 
uh, what he ended up having, I'm quite sure, something called uh, ulcerated colitis. And believe it or not, that's what I have. So ulcerated colitis is common uh, because all it is is an infection of the intestinal tract. Um, and I told him what to use based on the symptoms he gave me. So uh, I had asked him a number of questions before we went to it. And then for me to figure it out, I had to go to this book. And I, I did figure it all out. There's a whole bunch of calls coming. I know. I... Yeah, you better go. Uh, <laughs> nice she, she wanted to join us as, uh, for as long as she could. But with two people out, um, the phones are ringing off the hook. Okay, we have another question. Um, is that I haven't answered Charlie's one. Charlie, no, he's gone, or I haven't answered. No, okay. Charlie asked uh, uh, any giant run. I do not have any. We had uh, a pair on sale in our auction oh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, and they went. Uh, but uh, if you call uh, my home, uh, we'll call Foy's, and it'll give you my home phone number. I think I can probably find and give you a couple of phone numbers of people who do breed runs. So you know, just give me a call at Foy's. At what age is a hen old enough to pair up and produce eggs? The, there's no exact age, just like all. Uh, it depends on the bird uh, themselves, but the rule of thumb is nine months. You may see them breeding before nine months of age, six or seven months, but nine months is kind of what I uh, figured. Uh, also, uh, talking about that brings to mind uh, the 2020 birds ban, excuse me, we have an AUIF, IPB, NPA, um, the 2020 ban mostly are available now. You can call them and place your order. We won't ship them, I don't think, until next week. It, roughly it, after the 15th, we start sending our band. Now, we haven't got the AU in yet. I think we've got the NPA and AIPB. I'm not sure about the IF. But if you want to call and place your order, they'll take your order now. And what we do, and Vicki does it all, is she pulls the bands, registers the band, then put them in a shipping envelope, put your name on them. They're ready to go uh, on the 15th or 16th, whatever day it, it might fall on, uh, and they'll all be mailed to you. And this is the time of year where we get a lot of calls uh, for people who want low numbers. Well, we can't always do that, but the earlier you call, the lower the numbers are going to be available. I don't know where we stand now, but we get calls uh, all through the year, June, July, August, and they want three-digit numbers. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, with, for instance, NPA bands in a size 7, well, there's only going to be one set of 100. Then we go to 200. So if you want uh, low band numbers, call us as soon as you possibly can. Sean asks, I think Sean is a uh, customer of ours. I have enough birds I want to put a hold on breeding. I want them to stay paired up and don't have the room for two lofts to separate them. Is being, I've been using wooden eggs to slow them down from having babies. Is this okay and how long can I do this? You can do that with the wooden eggs uh, indefinitely because it, it causes no real problem. You throw the eggs away. When there's two eggs, you throw them away. You can put one wooden egg in there. They're going to lay them, lay on those wooden eggs or plastic eggs, not knowing the difference, uh, and they'll lay on them until they figure it out, unless uh, 20, 21 days, whatever day it is, uh, they'll figure out they're not going to hatch. And you pick them up, and if they're cold, or well, you know that uh, they want to start breeding again. So it's going to take them two, three, four weeks before they lay again, and you just keep repeating the process. But one of the other things that you can do is remove all your nest boxes or close them all up with wood or whatever, anything, just close them up. That will slow them down also. What's going to happen uh, eventually they'll lay on the floor, but it doesn't matter, but it will slow them down dramatically. So using the um, wooden or plastic egg, egg for an extended period, not a problem at all. Sean, thank you very much for your call. Um, Bryce, Bryson Rowe called, um, do you ship birds through the winter? Uh, actually, the best possible time 
to ship pigeons is in the winter. Uh, they're in the best of health. They've come through the molt. They've uh, uh, grown all new feathers. They're healthy. They're shining. Um, when you ship in the winter time, you have less possibilities of uh, illness uh, because the cold air is great for them. What really hurts when you're shipping pigeons, and, and I won't do it, but if you get up over 80 degrees, you, you shouldn't ship them at all because all of us know if we've shipped pigeons before, birds develop a lot of heat, a lot of body heat. Uh, and if you put four birds in a box, seal it all up, even with vent holes, uh, you open the box in, in an hour or two, and you'll feel the heat waves coming right out of it. So the best time to ship pigeons is in the winter. No question about it at all. Uh, Sean, thanks. Again, uh, we've been talking about breeding. We've talked, if you missed us, we've talked about uh, a number of different things. One of the things I wanted to mention during breeding season is this is a product that we have. It's made by Versalaga. It's called Success Corn. It's made specifically for breeding. So if you are feeding grain or if you're feeding um, pellets, it doesn't matter. Add 10%. Now, it says corn, and when we first saw the uh, advertisement for it from Versalaga, I assumed it was corn. Well, their language is different than our language. And uh, they call it, it actually is not corn. It is, let me see if it shows it. I don't know whether you can see it, but right here, it's a round, a small round pellet about the size of a pig. And it's meant to be given during the breeding season. So if you've got a 50 pound bag, you add 10 pounds of this and mix it all up. Uh, and at first they may not, they may uh, not want to eat it because it's strange to them. But what I tell people is if they eat all the grain, the pellets are still there. Don't feed them until they do eat those uh, pellets or the round pellets, and you'll get you'll end up having a much better um, breeding season. It's a high protein product for people who have who want to breed. You know, I, I, this is the second time I've uh, done the show without Gina. Golly, it's not easy. I have to take a deep breath. I'm already tired of talking. It would be like you trying to talk for an hour non-stop. Now you start out like a mo locomotive, you're full of steam, <laughs> but you, you, you sort of go downhill after that. Uh, I get questions throughout the week, uh, and some that I think are uh, worth uh, passing on to you, some good ideas. So here's one I got uh, this week. The gentleman's first name is Nick, he'll know who, who we're talking about. Uh, he's from uh, uh, New Hampshire, cold weather up there. I, as you know, I'm born in Maine, so I've been to New Hampshire many, many times. His question was this. I have a bird that sounds really congested with mucus when she breathes. Mucus is slimy, wet, snot. And I call it snot. Oh, he called it snotty. It's clearly a respiratory issue. What's currently the best treatment for the most stubborn of respiratory symptoms? Well, to me, that was an easy one. What he's got is something called mycoplasmosis. If you go through our catalog in the respiratory section, you'll see um, there are one or two different products uh, for mycoplasmosis. One I recommended was uh, something that we call uh, Mycoban, and he called the store to order it and tried to say we're out of it. So he emailed me back and wanted to know if there was another good product, and there was. The other one that I recommended was something called Doxy, Doxy T or Doxy Tie, D O X Y T Y. It's a combination of Doxy Cycling and and Thailand or Thylozin. Uh, it's great also. And it, and it brings up a point, and I'm glad that Nick sent me that uh, question, is that all of us, with the exception of Nick, he knew, uh, uh, most of us assume it's respiratory, it's a cold, and it's all the same. Well, if that were true, the only product we would sell would be Spiridox or Thailand or 
uh, Michael Mann. The point being, their respiratory is a description uh, of a, a family of diseases, much like paratyphoid. And one product doesn't take all of them. Uh, there's, there's ornithosis in most cases. That uh, is a one-eyed cold. Mycoplasmosis, that's where you have the slimy. If you open the beak, and you'll see slime coming down from, from top to bottom. And you'll also see sometimes brown feathers on their shoulder. That's because the bird is twisting its head, trying to wipe the mucus out of its eye. So there's a whole family. That's why it's so important if you do ask questions. Um, we're probably going to ask questions back to you. Give us as many of the symptoms as we possibly can, and we'll do our very best. And we back that up with um, the idea that if I really don't know, or if something doesn't work, um, we have contact with a number of veterinarians. happens on a weekly basis. If I don't know, I'll email the, one of these three uh, veterinarians and get an answer for you. Uh, or in some cases, if it's not respiratory, you can send droppings to FOIS and we'll have them analyzed by an avian veterinarian and uh, he'll see what he can see. And if he, if he can many times lead us in the right direction or tell us exactly what the problem is. Um, so that was Nick's question. Uh, and what I also told him, and I tell all of the people who buy medications from us, Follow all antibiotics with a good quality probiotic. We have a number of them. Foyce has their own. Uh, Rejuvenation is a great one. We just have a number of them. Uh, we have one uh, that we get from overseas from Norway. So if you're looking uh, for uh, probiotic, we certainly have them at Foyce. A lot of people ask me what the best one is. Uh, there's no such thing as the best one. Uh, I truly believe all of the products we sell are uh, good, um, and people just have preferences. Some may like to buy a Foy's product. Somebody wants to buy Pigeon Vitality. Somebody wants to buy a product made by Dr. Pigeon. So we have them all so that you have a choice as to which one is best. Uh, no such thing in my mind. Uh, which brings me to uh, the mind that uh, we, we're working and trying to work on the uh, catalog, the 2020 catalog, is not available. We truly believe, right, Veronica, we're going to have it ready for you uh, towards the end of January, good Lord willing, and we'll work harder. And, and uh, uh, But it's a year-long process. In fact, as I mentioned at the last show, I think I went on vacation, and I, I took the catalog with me and worked on it every day. Uh, Veronica works on it. Um, and I do a lot of hand stuff. We print it, and then I go through it and correct and corrections. Veronica makes corrections. It's a long, long process. Uh, but what brought that to mind is I think Veronica suggested that we put some information in there. Uh, basically, if I had to make a choice, which one would I use? Uh, it's going to be personal preferences, but we get the question all the time, well, which one would you use? And, the, of course, I answer that, well, if I had had to choose, this is the one I would do. So I'm going to try to include in the book on all the different diseases and all different situations, what kind of nest pads, what kind of nest bowls, what kind of nest boxes, like we had a question earlier. So that will be in the new catalog. And as I said, we're hoping to have the 2020-2021 catalog available latter part of January. Uh, uh, so I uh, hope you're looking forward to it. It's going to be an, another great catalog. Okay, we have another question sent in. Let's see. This one here is from a gentleman in... Uh, oh, where is it from? Oh, Colorado. And his first name is Len. Len may be watching. Um, his question was, I was wondering if there is anyone there that might have heard of a disease which I apparently have in my flock. It has killed 24 birds thus far and came on very sudden. The bird one week looks just absolutely perfect and the next day it's dead. Um, they don't act sick or listless 
most die during the night. They have now uh, stopped eating. As, as I think I should say not. They have not stopped eating as they normally do. Um, some have thrown up their feed. Uh, just red flags all over this. I already knew, I knew what it was right away. Um, uh, the rest of the flock now looks fleshless, but don't really act sick. I've looked up diseases, and one which describes some of these things say it is a virus with no cure. Have you heard anything like this? I absolutely have. It's going through the United States right now and uh, probably other parts of the world. It's a virus. Um, I'm led to believe it's the circle virus, and it is not treatable. Um, we've talked about this in the past. I had it a number of years ago. I lost 64 birds. I have a friend, we've talked about this before, Mike Owens, uh, who lost almost a thousand birds. Uh, it wouldn't hurt to vaccinate, first of all, if you want to do it. You can do it now uh, with a PMV vaccine, which is a, a vaccine for a different type of virus. But what the benefit of the vaccine uh, right now is that it stimulates stimulates the immune system. And it's sort of like the immune system is now going to war. It knows something has entered its body that's just foreign to it. So the immune system gets stronger and tries to fight this, uh, vaccine, this uh, uh, viral problem off. It isn't going to cure them, but it'll help prevent some of the ones that haven't got it to get it. And with a strengthened immune system, you have a better chance of uh, not losing as many. When a push comes to shove, uh, I, uh, I recommend what Mike Owens did. He used a product called NutriDrops, goes in the drinking water. And he said it stopped him, stopped his disease in the track. I think he ordered two cases of it. He keeps so many birds, but it stopped it. Uh, I recommend that you suggest you try the uh, nutri drops in the water. It's not terribly expensive, twenty, twenty-two dollars, something like that. Uh, and the first seven days, add a product called um, Typhoid Cure, T Y. No, no, I'm sorry, Young Bird Disease, uh, and you add that with a water in the water for uh, seven days or so. A lot of people have had good luck. I can't make you any promises, but if you uh, try it, I think you'll find in a lot of cases, it's going to help you out. Okay, well, guys, would you help me out? Guys and girls, would you help me out? Uh, uh, I need some questions. One question always leads to another. So if you've been thinking, uh, uh, if you have a question about your bird's health, about your pigeon loft, baskets, whatever it is, um, give me a call. We've been pretty much talking about breeding. If it's at all possible, um, we talked to a fellow who only has one section uh, and it's hard to remove the bird, but why don't you get your, all of the birds out of that loft, every one of them. Scrape it down as much as you possibly can. Get all the poop and droppings and stuff out of there and then spray it with a good, strong disinfectant. We have one called Novason. We have a number of them, different ones, but spray it before you do anything. You're going to scrape your purchase, scrape your floors, um, just make it as clean as possible, disinfect it, uh, let it, the disinfectant dry, and then put the birds back in there. Don't forget your nest boxes. If you left them in there, they're so, still dirty or soil, get them cleaned and spray that, spray the purchase, um, and you've got a much better chance of starting off a very healthy breeding season. We've talked about some products to use, um, but uh, the most important thing is to give some serious thought to clean out that law, uh, water. Um, Eddie uh, sent a question in. Thank you very much, Eddie. Uh, he just wondered, uh, the vitamin builders that you sell, what company makes it? Well, Eddie, we have, I would, I'm just wild guess, eight or nine. We get them from the natural company in Belgium. We get them from Versalaga, uh, a Belgium company. We make our own. We get them from Norway. We get them from uh, a couple of different uh, breeders, not breeders, manufacturers in the United States. 
we sell a lot of them. Everybody seems to have, have their favorite. Uh, uh, the biggest seller we have is uh, uh, one that we make ourselves. It's called Pigeon Builder. goes back to the originator or the past owner of this company. And uh, he came up with it. He was a, a uh, physician, not a physician, a pharmacist. And he made it called Pigeon Builder. We literally sell over a ton a year, 2,000 pounds of one product uh, or more. Uh, and it all goes back to when we first uh, bought the, the business from Claire. So Claire Hetlin, uh, I guess if I had to recommend one, it would probably be that. So if you have a specific one, if you want to know where it comes from, go online, go to our website, look in the catalog. We have them all. Most of them tell you where they come from, but if not, you can always call the store and we'll, we'll answer that question for you. But thank you very much for your question. If you have another one, send it in. Mike, do you have, do you have to vaccinate your breeders early this year? You have to breed them early every year. The best time to breed, to vaccinate your bird, and that's the PMV and the paratyphoid, I'm sorry, yeah, PMV, the virus, and paratyphoid bacterial infection. There are two different vaccines. The best time is to vaccinate them at least two or three or four weeks before. If the birds have never been vaccinated before, it requires two shots of each of them. They're both water-soluble. They can be given at the same time. And if they've never been vaccinated before, you give it to them once. And 14 days later, you, you give them what they call the booster shot. Believe me, if you think you're going to vaccinate them once, if they've never been vaccinated before, and you've done your job, uh, you're wrong. The second shot is more important than the first shot. But you can't have the second shot without having the first shot. And the reason for that is the first shot stimulates the immune system. The system's trying to fight it off. Uh, the second shot's called a booster. Uh, they're open to it now because the, shoe, the simple the immune system is kind of uh, recognized it. It's headed before. It's less likely to fight it off. And it, it, the booster is more effective than the first shot. So if the birds were vaccinated twice last year, well then from then on, that bird only gets one shot. And that, I hope that isn't confusing to you. But never, ever been vaccinated, two shots. Uh, been vaccinated, two shots last year, one shot from now on. Young ones, um, when they're weaned, they can be vaccinated. I've actually vaccinated some birds uh, in the nest, but the rule of thumb is wait until they're weaned, uh, and that's when you vaccinate them. But what, what I try to recommend is if you, if you have a separate section and you're weaning some birds, it's a little difficult to vaccinate one bird and wait until you get two more young ones. Uh, maybe collect your young ones in a separate cage all by themselves. And when you get eight or 10 or 12, vaccinate them uh, and then start the process all, all over again. Um, to wait uh, for the, all the birds to be vaccinated, uh, you won't be vaccinated, vaccinating for a good while. So it's better to do it that way. I do get a question on the vaccines, uh, because once you open that vaccine bottle, uh, the idea is supposedly is to use it all at once, but that doesn't work uh, for people who have just uh, eight or 10 or 20 or 30 birds because the, the bottles are 100 doses. So what I tell people, when you open it, you're gonna peel it open as an aluminum piece on to keep it uh, fresh. You open up that aluminum and then you have a rubber stopper. Get a brand new needle, a brand new syringe, stick it into the uh, bottle through the rubber, pull it back out. So you push the plunger all the way down first into the bottle. You pull it out, push it back in, then pull it out again. You're going to have a full uh, syringe uh, and you put it aside. Uh, you figure out how many birds that'll do. It's either a quarter cc or a half cc per bird. You'll read the directions. Uh, and when you're ready to fill that syringe again, switch needles, take that used needle off, put a brand new needle on, or the other thing you can do, take that used needle off, 
dip it into a disinfectant uh, and uh, put it back on again. You never want to stick a dirty needle. One that's been in the bird never goes directly into the bottle, if unless you're going to use it all at that one setting, uh, because you're contaminating the bottle from a, a bird to the bottle. If that bird has any problems, you're pushing that uh, product rate of the vaccine right back into the bottle and sucking it up, and it's contaminated. Once again, if I haven't made myself clear, uh, give me a call. One of the other things that I wanted to talk about today, some of you folks down in warm country don't have this issue. Um, it's kind of a reverse problem in the south. But wherever you have water that freezes, uh, we sell a lot of heaters this time of year. You can compare us to any other company in the United States. Nobody sells a complete line of poultry and pigeon water heaters than we do. Uh, but uh, you, what I tell people, I have anywhere from three to 500 pigeons. I have up to any one time 13 sections. I don't right now, but I do not use a heater and I'm in cold climate. Now, I'm probably going against the grain and I'm almost telling you don't buy a heater. That's your decision. I don't use them. What I do, is I use the 315 uh, drinker. It's a cone top with wires coming down the side. The bowl inside that I use is a heavy, heavy green plastic. And what I do, and you've heard me say this before, and I do this year round. When I go out in the morning, the drinker is froze solid. In most cases, when we get down uh, 10, 15, 20 degrees, it's froze solid. I pick it up, uh, I open the door, hit it on a concrete block, the ice pops out. I, then I put that drinker, the, the container, the green drinker, um, on the ground, and I put a brand new uh, drinker container in the loft. The reason I do that is I take the one dirty one, I'll put it in the house, wash it, and I'm ready for the next day. Now, then the people will say to me, and I've already got that question, well, what happens if you go into your loft and you water your birds in the morning and it's frozen an hour or two, froze all or they can't get any water? Doesn't matter. The birds get used to what, that. They drink all of the water they need and they don't get water again until the next day. Believe it or not, that works during breeding season for me too. Um, the parents feed them, uh, give those birds water uh, as needed and the next day they gulp it up go feed the young ones first, come back down and fill up again uh, because they get into the routine. They know they get water for the first half hour, first hour of every day. Uh, I don't change it twice a day. If you have the time and you're retired or you're home all day and you can change it twice a day, that's great. Now I mentioned it's kind of a, a reverse situation. In the South, where the winters are hot. I lived in Florida for a period of time in the winter. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good idea to change the water twice. In hot weather, when you get into the 70s, 80s, and 90s, bacteria builds up very, very fast in hot water, warm water. So if you're in a climate where it doesn't freeze at all, uh, it's a good idea, if it's at all possible, to change the water twice. Now, if you are medicating the water, you don't want to feed them a drink, give them the drinker twice because you're throwing away medicated water. But if you ever, uh, I know I talk about this quickly and sometimes I don't make myself clear. Once again, if you have a question, call FOIS. Our phone number is 724-843-6889. Uh, or you can get online. We have a website, of course. Uh, and you can order online. I did want to mention something also. We had, uh, we started the uh, Black Friday win about three years ago, Veronica, mm -hmm. and I laughed at them. I says, who the hell is going to use Bat Black Friday? There aren't that many pigeon breeders out there that are going to take advantage of it, and most of us are old and don't really want to get involved in these kinds of things. We were, we had a Black Friday last Friday. It was unbelievable. We had uh, 
we had normally we have four people answering the phone. No, it wasn't by phone. It was by all by email, right? It was all over the computer. We had uh, it's hard to compare, but we had in excess of a hundred approaching 150 different orders that day for Black Friday. We could not get them all. We tried to get everything out that same day. We just couldn't do it. Had too many orders. So we, the girls actually came in on uh, Black Friday. Uh, uh, we, we, it started on what uh, Black Friday. The girls came in Friday and Saturday to try to catch everything up because we knew right around the corner was Cyber Monday. It was, I hate to say, just bad. Vicky would come home and say, you can't believe how bad it was. You, my opinion, <laughs> how good it was. You folks supported us. We had some great, great sales. Uh, Cyber Monday, we paid all of the shipping. Uh, uh, it was like a gift to our customers. Uh, and we paid, we, it wasn't half, we paid it all. These are some examples. I know we sent, let's say we sent out two bottles of moxicillin powder. Uh, the, sh the cost of the product to, to ship it, uh, one of them, it would cost more to ship one than the product was, was uh, uh, priced, uh, $7.00. Uh, let's say a ten dollar order could have been seven dollars in shipping. So we thank you. It was our way of saying thank you because we knew we were going to lose money on a lot of those products, and we did. But uh, next year, if we have Black Friday, Black Friday was twenty five percent off plus a twenty five dollar gift certificate. Cyber Monday, free shipping on everything, um, and a lot of people stocked up for the year. But we expected that, and we certainly do thank you for supporting us. Once again, um, if, if you missed it, we had uh, auctions on Teddy Breed Homers, and uh, the, the Gabriel's uh, rare breed went to Muhammad, and the Pedigreed Racing Homers went to Chad. Um, and uh, they went for very high prices, uh, but you couldn't buy some of these birds for $1,000 a pair. Uh, the man just about basically um, cried when he had to get rid of them. In fact, he, the, uh, Bob called me and said, Jerry, I shipped the birds. He said, there's one r solid red cock bird in there. He said, never sell it, please. He says, it's an older bird. He says, um, I'm very attached to that bird. Uh, and I promised him that bird would never leave my loft and, until it passed away. Um, he was very, very close to his birds, spent a lot of money for his birds. Already, I don't want to overdo that. We had this is something that happens a lot. I shouldn't say a lot. People will go to their local uh, veterinarian or their college or university and get a necropsy, which is like an autopsy on pigeons, and want to, to try to find out uh, what was wrong. This one was done at the University of Minnesota, and he called me and said, "Jerry, he said I've got the results." They all gobbledygook to me. I don't know what the heck they're saying. So Dick sent them to me, and uh, what happens is the people at uh, most of these universities don't talk in English. They <laughs> they got these big long words. None of us know without looking them up. He did a necropsy on two birds, uh, one female, which was a 2016 bird, or oh, and another female which is a 2016 bird. Um, let's see, the liver, they had, he found problems, the university found problems in the uh, liver. Um, and here's where they get kind of, uh, I can have a hard time even pronouncing it. Penachayama, P-E-N, P-A-R-E-N-C-H-Y-M-A. -E -E what the hell is that, screw my English? <laughs> And he didn't know. Uh, I didn't know. I had to look it up myself. No microscopic uh, lesions are observed, uh, which is good. In the lung, in the heart, the spleen, the kidney, the crop, the gizzard, the brain, the tra trachea, and the pancreas, and the intestines. They could see nothing, no lesions in the, those at all. Uh, and it goes on. Uh, they check for chlamydia. They check for um, parasites including a coccidiosis, and it said 
OCYS, O-O-C-Y-S-T. Most of us would know. I run across that word a couple of times, and it's an egg. It's uh, of the uh, coccidiosis. Uh, the molecular diagnostic trachea is negative for perimoxivirus by PCR. Okay, what does that mean? Well, basically, he's, he's telling us that the bird doesn't have canker. Well, I didn't say he didn't, have, just they had to make it long. Calm cause of death, <laughs> euthanasia. Well, I know when you send a bird in for an autopsy, they're going to have to kill that bird. So it died because they killed it. <laughs> okay, don't mind me, I'll laugh. Um, comments. There is evidence of previous injury to the liver, livers, likely as a result of ascarid larvae migration a common cause of granuloma formation in pigeons. Also, a previous bout of bacterial hep hepatitis is possible. Well, what they said right there was they believe that the gentleman over-treated the birds uh, for worms. And too much of anything is never a good thing. It affected the, it affected the liver and the uh, kidneys. So. They don't tell you what to use, most of these necropsies. Um, they leave that up to you. Uh, but um, in reading it, um, they did find there was no significant growth in the intestines. There's a little bit of a problem with the liver. The, they took a culture looking for paratyphoid. They found one very, very low grade. Not even enough to treat, but you have to keep an eye on that. It could grow. Um, an atrium E slide, uh, an atrium E slide showed <laughs> seven, this isn't worth reading. Uh, Newcastle disease, negative, did not have Newcastle. And for us, that means Newcastle is paratyphoid. Um, and fecal examination did show coccidiosis. Uh, so here again, they mentioned coccidiosis twice. I recommended to uh, the gentleman who sent it in that he treat with aviocox. And uh, last time, uh, and then after that, follow with a probiotic for a couple of days. And uh, when he, one of the things I asked him about when he worked on the coccidiosis, he had treated for coccidiosis. You have to clean the floor, nest boxes, and perches as much as you can every day after the treatment for coccidiosis. Because coccidiosis um, is, is not ki killed. They, well, if they do, we'll put it this way, when you treat them, it may get rid of the coccidiosis, but the bird could have uh, released some droppings. The droppings could have had the eggs of coccidiosis, in the droppings, and it then grows and becomes a problem again. The bird's picking it up, and you have this cycle. That's why it's so important. If you treat for coccidiosis, what you want to do is clean it completely. The first time might be tough. The second time, you'll clean it uh, very, very quickly. But you do that every day uh, that you treat for coxy. Then after that, be sure to follow it with uh, a, a, a good probiotic once again. Uh, you make that choice. So, if you ever have run into this case where you get a necropsy and don't know what the heck it means, um, if you can send a copy of it to me, I'll uh, do my best to um, read it through and translate it for you. I've only got about eight more minutes, and if you want to call in, we certainly do invite you to do that. Um, but it's, it's breeding season. Give some serious thought to the breeding season. Um, if you separated your birds, uh, as I do, I was going to try to do it this past weekend. I just didn't get to it. But now what I do is I have an eight by, uh, roughly an eight by ten section. What I'm going to do is pick out the two pair, or do a hand on the cock that I know I want mated. Um, they're separated, so they're ready to mate. And here it's December. I know a lot of you folks don't re uh, breed until uh, a little later, maybe later in the springtime. But I start now. Uh, and what I, what I do is I put a hen and a cock in the empty section with open uh, nest boxes or 
if I've got rows and rows of nest boxes, I leave one or two open. I let that pair mate up. It only takes a little bit of time because they're anxious to mate. And I let them pick out a nest. Then uh, once that's done, I band them red and blue. And I band them with a one and a one uh, on, a, on the same leg. That tells me that's pair one. Then I go pick another hen and cock that I think would be a, a good mating. Do the same thing. Let them pick out, open up another best nest box or two. And then I let that pair pick out their nest. Uh, makes it a lot easier, reduces on uh, future fighting if you do it this way. And then when they're mating, I put a two and a two, and I put a blue and a pink, which tells me it's pair two, which one is the cock, which was, one is the hen. So I go through that process. Now, that's a, a, a time-consuming process. Um, and if you have a whole lot of birds, of course you can't do it that way. The only other alternative is to put them in breeding boxers that way until they're mated and then put them in a section. Or if you're not particular about your mating, just put all your hens and cocks to, together and they'll pick out their own parents. Um, but it's, this is the time to, as I said at the beginning of the show, vaccinate. This is the time. Uh, I, I, you've heard me say it time and time again. I don't believe in using antibiotics to clean the birds out before you put them together. I've talked to uh, various um, veterinarians from around the world. They agree. makes no sense to use an antibiotic um, when you don't know if the birds are sick. On the other hand, uh, there's a product called 3-in-1. We have 4-in-1, 3-in-1, 5-in-1, 10-in-1. My suggestion is to go to 3-in-1. It's for canker, coccidiosis, and worms. And those three products, bless you, Veronica. She sneezed and she didn't hear her. 3-in-1 uh, treat canker, coccidiosis, and worms. It is, there's no antibiotic in it. Canker, coccidiosis, and worms are protozoa or bugs. Um, antibiotics don't work on that, just like we were talking about coccidiosis. Um, Either use three in one uh, if your wallet or pocketbook allows you to it. The best way is to buy a canker product, buy a coccidiosis product, and buy a uh, canker and buy a worm product. And follow the directions. It might take you a week or two or three weeks to do it this way. Don't mix them. I like the idea if I'm worried about worms, I'm going to use a worm product, coccidiosis. Same thing. Maybe it might be a good idea to send a sample of your droppings into foys before you put all your birds together. Just take a sampling, maybe two, three, four samplings throughout your loft, send them into us. We'll have a veterinarian look at them. And if you have a problem, we're going to tell you what to use versus a, a shotgun approach. Can't find all of the um, uh, bacterial infections in the droppings, but you can find a lot, and you can certainly find the three most common canker coccidiosis, can canker coccidiosis and worms. We've only got two or three more minutes. I'm uh, sorry that um, Gina wasn't able to join us. We tried. It just didn't work out technically. Uh, we tried. Sherry tried to come in and sit in because it's much easier to do a show when you have a sidekick. Um, now I, now I know, not that you compare me, but I remember, remember uh, Johnny Carson. He always had somebody sitting next to him. He never did the show by himself because it's so much easier when Gina is here. We go back and forth, and um, if I have to take a drink or I'm tired, she'll jump in. Or I just like picking on Gina, and we have a lot of fun. Uh, got a couple of more minutes. Um, if you have a question, we do invite you. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to have in our next auction. It will be at least one pair of pedigree homers. I'm pretty sure I'm going to offer a pair of American fantails, and we have, a, have other birds uh, that we're going to have uh, in future auctions, but there'll be three pair. And when I go to the Lancaster, Pennsylvania show, uh, we will take a a number of birds there at the Lancaster show and have what's called a, a silent auction. So if you're in the, in the Lancaster area, you're too late. 
she's going to try, but we only got two minutes left. But you're welcome. This, if you weren't here at the beginning of the show, this is Sherry. She's my um, uh, person of choice after. But the reason we uh, can't use uh, Sherry on a regular basis is she's working. Uh, as you know, she started the show with us and had to leave because all the phones started to ring. But they're slowed down now. I know, but um, I know it's almost the end of the show. No, keep this in mind. We've decided the show ends when we want it to end. Oh. So if it goes to 5 or 5.10 or 5.15. I won't be here. I mean, no, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> when it goes to 4, four yeah, when it goes after 4, we can go. Well, but anyways, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, wish everybody a Merry Christmas. I'm, I'm never hardly on the show, but being that it's getting so close to um, the holidays, I just wanted to wish all our um, pigeon friends a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Did you get any particular questions while you were out there taking orders or none just couldn't handle? Uh, I think I handled it all or else no. I would have peeked in here. Okay. Looking for the expert. Okay. Well, I certainly, from boys, we do wish you. Um, you can stay for a little bit. If, like I said, we're still squeezing in another question. But we talked about breeding. I want to give me that uh, plug, please. What's going to the energy corn? Oh. We, we talked about this. And here again, this one is energy corn. If you, if you race pigeons or fly rollers or tiplets, if you're looking for a way, uh, to add energy, this is what you want. Now, once again, it says energy corn. We had to learn it's not corn. It's round pellets. So when you talk about energy corn, you get it. Don't be surprised if it's not kernels of corn. It isn't. It's a pellet. The same with this one. And it makes itself success corn. This one is a mixture. It's meant for the breeding pair. And let me read you if I can find it because it, it, it's in a whole bunch of languages in, on here. Let me see. I was reading it earlier, but it actually does have, oh, I can't find it now, but it has corn, it has peas, it has all of these different vegetables. Pigeon people from the old days would always tell you they would chop up lettuce, they would chop up carrots in small pieces, they would Anything like that, kale, they, they would put it out because the birds did need it. We got away from that. Let me find it real quick. I found it very interesting. There's so many languages here. <laughs> Let me see. Let me find this one. That's a different language. And this one in English? That's not English. Oh, here it is here. It's got 25% protein. That's too much during breeding season, but if you're flying pigeons, that's a high protein. 10% to 50 pounds of feed. It's got, um, well, let me find them. Vitamin E, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin D, vitamin E, K3. It's got uh, other, all kinds of vitamins. I'm trying to find, it's got calcium. It's, where did I see the carrots? It's got corn. It's got carrots. It's got beans, it's got berries, it's got elderberry, it's got cranberry, it's got linseed oil, uh, which you get fatty acids, it's got mineral seeds. So you can see it, it's a great, great product. And it's not a feed. We, we always, when we first heard it, we kind of knew the right. We thought it was a feed, it's not. It's a feed supplement. And the, the recommendation is if you're using 10%, so put this in a big barrel, or a five-gallon container, uh, put in 50 pounds of feed if you can, or a bigger container, and add 10 pounds of this. It's so easy. And if you're going to do 25 pounds, it's two and a half pounds of this. All right, you have a, quick, a couple of questions. Did the Versalaga feed come in? I'm sorry to say, but... No, but we do have Versalaga feed in we stock. Do. We have some, not all of them, but this is a Versalaga product. Um, it's ordered, it's just not here yet. We're hoping to get it soon. But we do have, gentleman was here today to buy Versalaga, and uh, uh, he he bought the, um, the, the curatives. No? So we do have a number of them, just not all of them. Wasn't there another question, or did it yeah. drop off? Okay. It's, what's a good sour crop in pigeons? What's a good sour crop treatment, I would imagine. Well, I would think yeah. so, too. That yeah. 
Um, sauerkraut is unusual in pigeons. Uh, Sam, I'm assuming, it, I'm guessing, it's a uh, powder or in a powder family. Once in a while, other pigeons get it, but it's very, very rare. Uh, and what you will see is a buildup in the crop. Uh, you touch it. It's not full of air like some problem. It's squishy uh, and it's liquid and it's sour. That's where the word sour comes from. If you smell it, it stinks to high heaven. So what you can first try is, um, and it sounds weird, tied birds head, head, uh, legs together, the two legs, connect them together, then hang them upside down. Sounds strange, but in the upside down position, and what I tell people is you could also take tape and tape its wings so it can't flop all the way around, the all of the gook it's in their chest will be cleared out. It'll eventually, you'll see it'll pour out. And when it stops coming out, I'll just you know, cut, the, cut the strings that uh, held the bird together, so to speak. And then get yourself a turkey baster. And with that turkey baster, you're going to suck up some warm, some warm water and some baking soda. Right? Yeah. And you, you, why, did you recommend that one time? Uh, yeah, I did. Okay, you were right. Huh? And you put that solution of baking soda and water into the crop. You massage it so that it's getting in all around. And then you turn it upside down and massage the, the breast and it'll all come out. You might have to do it once or twice. Normally, it settles the matter. There are other products that you can use, but that's a, a no cost to use. And it's pretty easy to do. If you need more information, call for us and you and I will sit down and talk about it on the telephone. Do you deliver to UK? Yes, we do. On a regular basis, we have a couple of very wealthy people. And if they want uh, a medication, uh, I fly over there uh, first class. First class. Uh, the customer, of course, pays for my flight uh, <laughs> and I pay for my hotel. Um, of course, I've got to eat too. Um, but I'll hand deliver the medications without any problem at all. So in answer to your question, yes, we do deliver to the UK. <laughs> we don't mind. And Sherry would be glad to do that, wouldn't you, oh, Sherry? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Been, a, a, I think, an informative show. Hope it wasn't too boring. One of the problems in doing a show like this when I'm all by myself, all I can do is, uh, answer the questions on the screen and talk about product. There's no byplay between Sherry and I, just like she was giggling a little bit. Uh, we like to have fun on the show. And I, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Did you see the email we got about uh, the show? The show. It was a long email. And it was so nice. He said, basically, he says, it's fun to watch you guys. Because you're having fun, which makes it fun for us. He says, uh, I've always got a, I'm always laughing throughout the show, the way you treat uh, Gina and the way Gina always comes back uh, to you. And uh, the fact that he says, what's most impressive is you guys don't try to sell product. You suggest products, but you don't try to sell them, tell them what the price is, give them a sale or something like that. It's just all information to help the fancy. And he said, thank you. It was really a, a heartwarming note because we do our very best and it's corny as hell. But at Foy's, believe me, the customer comes first. So if we make a mistake, we make it good or even better than what the original order was. So once again, thank you very much. Talk to you in a couple of weeks. Merry Christmas. <laughs>